I absolutely love the work of René Lalou. 1987's Gandahar, his final feature, featured visuals designed by French comics artist Kaza, based on a 1969 novel by Jean-Pierre Andrevon, titled, in English, The Machine Men vs. Gandahar. So what is 1987's Gandahar? Where did it come from, and why don't they still make films such as this? Gandahar is, as aforementioned, related to the wild and creative French comic scene of the 1970s, inspired by 20th century science fiction literature, and the transcendent, limitless possibilities which animation had teased at throughout the decades prior to Gandahar's release. Now, what happened to films like Gandahar? Are there a lot of them? You might find enough trippy, Arthur C. Clarkean science fiction anime to sate your interest. There's some of it out there. Although among Western animation during the 20th century, these are seemingly few and far between. Now, there has been something of a resurgence in Western 2D animation during the 21st century, although much of this is relegated to television series, intended to make people laugh, supplement drugs, or make one think its creators are cool. No one is interested in imagining what a consciousness-raising composition might resemble. What I'm saying is, Adult Swim was all in all disappointing, although I loved Super Jail, and remained so. Enjoy these screen caps as I depart on some lunatic tangent. Responsible for three legendarily trippy science fiction animated features, the imagination that Lalu was capable of conjuring, no doubt relying on the most talented of artists and animators, is utterly astonishing. These days, asking one where they get their ideas from is almost irrelevant. The recorded history of humanity is accessible to anyone with a desktop computer, or less than that even. One can be inspired by any work of art, from any era, from any place, from any movement, or any culture, mythology, or artist. Being born in 1996, it is wondrous to think that pre-internet one could deliver an imaginative vision so potent and alive. I have to admit it is hard for me to imagine the world pre-internet, an archaic time wherein information had to be sourced outside of one's home. The world might have actually felt like the world, and not a controversial concept, the nature of which is debated on the internet. Of course, at one time, the 1990s and to an extent the 2000s, which I did experience, albeit at a very young age, were still a time and place wherein we lived in the real world and experienced going to a place called the internet, where we discussed the real world's attributes, debated its mysteries, hoping to uncover its secrets. But now the real world doesn't seem real. The formerly real world is a place wherein we constantly need to check the internet, are expected to check the internet, in order to understand it. The world, that is. This real world might be traditionally real. It is comparably material, that is, not digital, although experiencing it is not as reliably accurate a means of understanding it as consuming the contents of internet. One's knowledge of Gandhar in the 20th century, as well as the other works of René Lalu, was a distinct privilege. To view one of these was like discovering a prophetic future artifact, a vague foreshadow of our species' long-awaited New Age utopia, hidden away in the annals of one of the cooler video rental shops. By the 21st century, it was easier for some to potentially reduce Lalu's work as being downstream of a worn, psychedelic zeitgeist. It came, it went, it was great, it looks nice on my shelf, but let's move on, what's on the market now? This is similar to my perception of French comics artist Mobius, who collaborated with Lalu on 1982's Time Masters. Mobius, to me, is indicative of imagination's seemingly limitless capacities. In the 21st century, we have subconsciously embraced Mark Fisher's concept of capitalist realism, accepting depression as a fact of life and one's bank account as the epitome and an encapsulation of one's worth. Is it naive to think that there must be more to human organisation? The, the view that this is all there is to human organisation, that what we have right now is, you know, the best that we can come up with, that seems more naive to me. The sheer sum of suffering that has been reduced over the course of the last hundred years is phenomenal. Any defeatism I hear just sounds more naive to my ears, far more so than any dream they deem to cry as delusion. Cynicism is a privilege. Many are struggling to survive. Those who want to use their imagination to see a future with even less suffering, to dismiss these ideals is undeniably sinister. 
If one can imagine a superior future, try and achieve it. I mean, why not? To whom or what am I railing against, though? Any defeatists anywhere, any age on any part of the political spectrum. A certain, oh, why bother, that's just the way the world is, mentality. Think about what we imagined in the 20th century, what we could be capable of in the 21st. This is just disgraceful. People seem miserable. Whose fault is it? Partially their own, partially everyone around them. Many people my age express disdain but that to submit and find a compromise to make money, hold down a romantic relationship, and or afford to rent a property. We can't buy, thanks bloated boomer bastards. We were all born into some rather miserable circumstances, to be sure. We were all taught as children that life is beautiful and magical, for our parents' of amusement, no doubt, and then as adolescents we were berated and belittled by this same generation for having any expectations at all. But why did so many give in? Why do so many of my age bracket give in? It only ends in more misery and a potential suicide. Do whatever you want. Fuck the should. Whatever keeps you from feeling depressed, do. Consider both your physical and psychological survival. But I'm willing to be convinced otherwise. Have a beautiful day.